Hey fearsome friends, I'm so happy to be reading for you again. Do you miss me? I shall try my best to get a video to you every week and we'll soon do a live stream so we can catch up. Tonight I have 12 Let's Not Meet stories for you, just to remind you of the dark side of the human race. So sit back, relax and get cosy, comfy, warm because it's time to let your nightmares in. It finally started raining here, so I took my son, who is 14, out to do some mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we'd normally go, and the sun goes down much earlier at this time of year, but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back, so we weren't looking to be out too long. We hoped to find some turkey tails or chanterelles, but we took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field. There was a trail that would take us back around to the main trail and the river, so we weren't worried. However, as we walked towards the main trail and the last group of people had left, it was just me and my son as we went along, when out of a thicket side trail came this really weird looking man. He had a dog with him at his side who was alert and he was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. He then began waving at us in this really weird slow way. I was immediately uncomfortable and got goosebumps but didn't want to be impolite, so I half-heartedly waved whilst staring back and telling my son to slow up a little, as I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dawdling, the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail towards the main trail, but even though we'd passed him, I was feeling really wary. I didn't want to go too fast, so we stopped to look at some plants, and the guy and his dog were further down the trail which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking at that moment that if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude would actually be waiting around the corner for us. And guess what? He was standing at the junction off to the left and towards the parking lot, and to the right was a point six trail to the river. The guy was just standing there with his dog staring at us and not moving at all. Both my son and I were very perturbed by this, so kept a wide berth to the right. He looked old, so we're sure we could outrun him. He continued to stare at us as we approached, so I asked if he was okay. He was greasy-haired, wore tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, plaid long shorts, and looked to be about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix, but he didn't answer me at all, just kept staring. We turned to the right and walked about a block, and I had my phone's camera facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder. But the only movement he made was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him then. His stare was moderately unsettling, made more so by his lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses and slow wave. This is a true story that absolutely traumatised my boyfriend and I. Two years ago I moved to the UK to go to university. I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too toxic for me. So in the first uni year I moved into student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year. I met my boyfriend who I'm still with today and I just enjoyed my time away from my family, discovering what independence really was. The second year came by and I decided with some friends to move into a house that was rented by student accommodation. But at least we had our own house and weren't restricted with the amount of noise we made and parties we had. Now just for context, I had a ground floor room and my window faced onto a very small backyard where I would go and smoke. And in this yard, there was a very thin wooden door that led out to the street. This door could only be closed and locked from inside, but as it was old, we had to attach some strings to keep it properly closed. We had neighbours on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and some other students. The neighbours on the right of us were five males, who quite honestly looked way over university age, and they were a little strange. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention 
due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I'd heard some screams, so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them covered in blood and cuts all over his arm, and he also had a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. My flatmates and I didn't know what to do, so we offered him our help to clean himself up and gave him an old t-shirt to change into. We then saw the guy who'd hurt everyone, being escorted out by the police, put into a van and driven off to be arrested. Now I don't know anything else about the story as the police didn't really tell us anything, but the guy who we'd helped was quite weird himself. He would talk a lot of rubbish and kept trying to grab and flirt with me, and we noticed that he also smoked a lot of marijuana. After some time had passed, I would go about my routine, going to uni, coming home, and I'd see him quite often in the street. But one day he came up to me as I was making my way to the corner shop and began saying weird things to me. I didn't feel comfortable at all, so I just didn't respond. But then he said, Oh, that's okay. I'll just wait in front of your house then and we can talk further. Needless to say, I was very creeped out, but just thought he was joking. So I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street. And as I turned on to where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep waiting for me. I panicked and went back to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away. But he wasn't home and no one else was either. So I just waited it out until they'd left an hour later and I sprinted back home and locked the front door. I'd just like to note here that my front door had a glass panel on it so you'd be able to see who was at your door before answering it. And after this already pretty scary encounter, I tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day as I was having a smoke in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open and the strings that we'd put on there to keep it closed had been cut. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it at the time. I just closed the door and put a new string on thinking it had been one of my flatmates who'd taken the bins out and just hadn't tied it back up properly. After that, the weird neighbours would very often scream, yell and fight in their house, and it would wake my flatmates and I up in the middle of the night, but we kind of got used to it after a while. One evening, however, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did, and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a loud bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep, so he very silently woke me up, and we both just waited in the dark and listened out for any other noises. Suddenly we heard the wooden door bang very loudly, shoot open and then some footsteps next to my window. We heard them clearly, as I always had my window open. We both froze, then we heard the door leading to the backyard being shaken softly, as if they were trying to get in. Then it stopped. Luckily we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get the hell out of the room and lock them in if they'd come in through the window. But just then we heard my window move. It was being opened further, and one of the guys was saying something in a different language as they were trying to get in. My boyfriend and I shot up out of bed, took my phone, put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms. Then the police luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were only a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police had been, as I think my boyfriend and I were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, and the other had fled, later being found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they'd gone inside their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and we also found out that they'd been carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I'd never done anything to offend our neighbours, so the idea of them breaking in with God knows what intention, and with a kitchen knife, absolutely terrorised my boyfriend and I. The two guys ended up being arrested, and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I didn't hear anything else from the police, and I moved back home a few months later as I was so scared and traumatised for months by it. What would have happened if my boyfriend hadn't have woken up? I'm still now coping with it and finding it really tough to get over it. Always asking myself, what if, and what would have happened if? 
I now very often wake up because of the slightest noise and get horrible nightmares. But hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend, and we often talk about it, which helps a lot. So this happened years ago, and I guess my mind has blocked this memory. As the other day, whilst talking to my previous boss, he reminded me of this experience, and it all came flooding back. I used to work at an office where mostly men worked, and a lot of the time they would misinterpret my being friendly with something more. So because of this, I tended not to be so friendly, especially with newcomers, and it resulted in me basically disengaging in office chat or gossip with anyone. That week there was a new employee who wasn't on my team, so I hadn't even noticed him until three days later, when he approached me to introduce himself. After that he tried to talk to me all day, even though our stations weren't that close together, so I had to tell him a few times that I was very busy and couldn't chat. I assumed we had different lunch times as I hadn't seen him during my break. But the next day, he had lunch at the same time as me, and I found myself alone with him. So I started to pick up my things and leave, when out of nowhere he said, I know girls like you play hard to get, but I really think you're beautiful. So how about we get a hotel room after work tomorrow? My girlfriend is going to a dinner, so I'm free. We don't have to do anything if we don't want to, of course. We can just hang out. At first I thought it was a joke, as it really sounded like one, though I didn't laugh. But I asked him instead if he was serious, and he said, yeah. Why do you think I would ever be interested in you? The fact that you just mentioned a girlfriend surprised me. How is she even attracted to you? I said. Though he was actually attractive, I wasn't insulting his looks. There was just some smugness or attitude about him that I really didn't like. He became really serious then, stood up and walked away, not saying a word. Now his schedule ended an hour before mine, and as soon as he left, other co-workers approached me looking worried, telling me he'd been saying some disturbing things, like how he knew people who could stab me or how he could convince his girlfriend to do it if he told her the right things. Also, that I should be taught a lesson for being so disrespectful. I honestly freaked out and went straight to HR, who assured me they'd speak to him. The one thing he would keep repeating over and over to everyone who heard him, though, was how disrespectful I had been. And when confronted by HR, the next day he quit on the spot, and they told me he blamed me for losing his job and had made more threats against me. I never saw him again, thankfully, and he didn't try to contact me again either. A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made darn good money delivering. I had worked at a few other places, both private and chains, in previous years, and I still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. Now I choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason, but on this incident I was luckier than I could ever imagine. One night I was working and had a double delivery to take. Both were cash orders, and I had $12 left in my bank what drivers are given to use as change for cash orders so you don't have a ton of cash on you whilst you're out and about. The first order went smoothly, and the guy gave me a 50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip, and then I drove to the second delivery. It was at an apartment complex with multiple buildings, and I recognised that I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still very light out and the chain I worked at had us drive all white sedan company cars with the logo on it, and this is important for later. So I grabbed the order and made my way to the door to the apartment building, when a young guy came out. A much bigger, older guy was already outside smoking a cigarette, and as the smaller guy came out, he went in. The smaller guy looked around nervously and asked how much he owed me, but the way he was looking around made me very nervous. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, so I told him the amount, 
and that's when he said that it wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something was very wrong as I felt someone else walk behind me from the door. The young guy was then looking around and down the parking lot, craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him, trying my best to keep calm, when suddenly there was a gun being held to my right temple. I also felt something poking my spine. Two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and keys now, the first guy growled, so I immediately fumbled for my keys. I gave him my bank but hadn't realised the fifty was mixed in so I gave him the keys, trying my best to remain calm. When another guy came up from my left who had big hair and was around the same age as the other guy. The one behind me I hadn't seen yet, but the big hair kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off to hide. Then the first kid searched the company car. Luckily I'd left my wallet in my personal car, but I saw him grab my cell phone, and that's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my then five-year-old son, who was my world. So I begged, please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. I was lying. My son is very much alive. Then the kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, listen to him and you'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell he'd been crying by how his voice sounded, when just then a car began to pull in and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran away though, he dropped the gun in front of me. It was a standard issue 9mm silver and black with the safety off. It looked completely real to me, and he picked it back up and ran with the others. The car that pulled in saw me and it was a woman and her kid. Panic set in though, as I realised they could easily come back and finish what they'd started, especially now it was getting dark. I collapsed right there. They had taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright, and she took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so much I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to 911 as she set down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assume, helped me call, and I spoke to the operator and told her everything. Now, I'm colourblind, but these guys were obviously wearing all black and white clothes, thank goodness, so I had a full description of two of them. The poor woman who had helped me was going to be late for work because of this, but she still stayed with me until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator, but I will never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriend. The cops showed up and contacted my store, and my manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I'd been hurt, and it meant a lot to me to see how much they cared. I told them I was fine though, then I filed the proper paperwork, and the $72 was written off as a loss. Thank goodness because I had worked other stores that make you pay back the money out of pocket if you get robbed, just to prevent drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself, and he gave me a hug. He was to this day one of the best bosses I've ever had, but what I didn't know was I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend before I left from the store phone and asked where he was as we usually met up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at the bar, so I went to meet up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in, and he told me his dad had given him a heads up, so he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the drinks we played pool, when his dad called and asked if I was with him yet. He said yeah and handed me the phone, and his dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him I'd had two shots so he sent out a squad car to get me since it wasn't that far anyway, and once at the station, it turned out they had suspects in custody, and I was needed to ID them. It was three boys and a driver, and they'd been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery, speeding. The bolo had already gone out, and they matched the description. 
They had used the money they'd stolen to buy weed and gas and taken off, having stolen at least 15 cell phones. The order had been placed on a stolen phone, and mine was in the mix. The police told me to grab my phone only, so I did. Then I was asked to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification, so that was easy. Nine of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have completely reset, but thankfully it unlocked for me. Then I told the police every detail about the incident again. My parental instincts kicked in, and I told them that the guy behind me was quite obviously bullied into it. He was the one with the white shirt, I told them. The police, wide-eyed, then told me he was the one talking and the other three denied involvement. That's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. He was apparently completely unaware of the robbery and thought he was just picking up friends. He was never charged. The boy who was behind me and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. It makes sense now when the guy who'd confessed had said to me that they wouldn't have my phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops, had they not been caught. But the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday, so he got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom he made fun of me and was laughing at me, and seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him for his behaviour, but he just grinned and glared at me like the Joker. All I could see was pure evil, and I was sure this kid would go on to commit more crimes. I have no doubt he will eventually end someone's life as you can see how cold he is just by looking in his eyes. I grew up in a town full of murderers and abusers, but I had never seen this kind of evil in my life, and I never want to again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and to remain anonymous in case he ever got out, and I'm so glad I did this, because today I got a letter from the state saying he's being released in February. The court only had my old address, which is my parents' house, and my mum didn't think the letter was important, but I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years. It's only been four, and he's getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behaviour. Overcrowding. It's this coming February, and I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, and everyone I know knows his face and name. And if he tries anything, we are all ready. But for his sake, let's not meet. This happened when I was 12 or 13, and back then in the late 80s, there was a curfew for anyone underage. I don't know if it still exists, but it matters for the story. So me, a female, and my best friend, also female, would walk around the neighbourhood at night. She would stay over at my house a lot, and vice versa, most weekends, and we would crawl through my bedroom window to walk around and visit our middle school friends, or just go to the park to hang out. We were well aware of the curfew, so if we saw headlights, we'd run and hide so we wouldn't get caught. And one night, we were doing our thing, when exactly this happened. We saw headlights so ran to hide under a carport. The car pulled into the driveway we were hiding in though, and when the guy got out he started yelling. You trying to rob me, he said. So we ran like the wind. My friend went one way and I the other, when I heard her scream. I looked back and could see she'd been caught as she had her hands up. I realised that I couldn't just leave her there by herself. So I walked over with my hands up too, saying, It's okay, we're just kids. That's when I noticed he had a gun. He was pointing it at her and she was hyperventilating. So I walked up slowly, trying to explain that we weren't trying to do anything crazy, just running from possible cops. Then he pointed the gun at me, saying something about us trying to rob him. I reiterated that that really was not the case and that we were just hiding from possible cops because of the curfew. But he made us pull our shirts up to show, supposedly that we had no weapons. We were 13 years old. Thinking back on it, I reckon he was just being a perv. Then he let us leave after that. This was 30 years ago, but I often wonder what would have happened if I'd just kept running. 
I also wonder what would have happened if I or my friend had told an adult about it. I mean, it was a few streets from my house. He could have been identified. Or maybe, ultimately, we were actually the bad guys. I'm 14, and one year ago I was subjected to abuse by my special education teacher and my math and science teachers for my entire 8th grade year. I suffer from dyslexia, and I'm suspected by family and my therapist to suffer from autism, and I also have a history of depression, and currently an undiagnosed mental illness. I had told my special education teacher at the beginning of the year that I wasn't feeling okay, and that I had attempted suicide during the middle of the seventh grade, due to how horrible my mental state was. So I got asked the basic questions. Was I being abused at home? Have I thought about doing it again, etc. But what surprised me was that I wasn't sent to a mental hospital after this conversation. Hell, my parents weren't even called. But I thought I'd gotten lucky with this, because I didn't want my mum to know that I'd told anyone anyway. However, I was so very wrong. I wasn't lucky at all. I had given something to this woman that she could use against me, and something it turned out that she would use against me. The next day, my special education teacher told my homeroom teacher, and my maths and science teachers, about what I'd told her, and now my homeroom teacher wasn't the nicest woman. Actually, she wasn't nice at all. She now yelled at kids for minor mistakes, showed favourites towards the more smarter, gifted ones, and even told the rest of us to give up on trying to even go to high school. In my opinion, though, these actions were ten times more common when it came to me. She'd constantly shame me for everything, and I mean everything. My spelling, my handwriting, the way my desk was organised, how messy my hair was due to not taking care of myself, all of it. She knew about what I was going through, what my mental state was like, and how much I hated myself for my conditions. She yelled at me despite knowing I'm sensitive to loud noises, and she told me not to even bother trying to keep my grades up, because I wasn't going to survive high school. She said I was better off in a homeless shelter, because I had trouble with catching up with the rest of my classmates, and that no one would want to hire me for anything. That I should give up on art because it wouldn't do anything for me in the future and she acted like it was my fault for failing whenever we had parent-teacher conferences. Whenever I told my mum about all this, I was left with disbelief and punishment, and eventually during the fall I had trouble concentrating on basic things. I'd even black out during random moments in class, and when I'd wake up I'd be yelled at again which would send me into a mental breakdown. She was only ever nice to me when I gave her something for special events like her birthday or holiday despite her unjustified hatreds towards me, and how badly she ruined me. I was trying to get her to like me as a person, so I'd give her gift after gift, each holiday showing false appreciation, in the hopes of her going easier on me. But every time, she'd just continue. My special education teacher wasn't much help either, as she and my homeroom teacher would talk about me behind my back, saying that I was a lazy son of a bitch who wouldn't make it far in the world, and that it would be better for me to give up on my future entirely. It wasn't even like they didn't know I was listening, because they did, and I'd look at them in utter disbelief every time, questioning why they would say these things about a child. They knew I was watching, and in fact constantly looked at me while they talked, making sure I was listening. They did this for the entire year, and it was a cycle I couldn't avoid, because my mum simply refused to transfer me, telling me that she'll put me in the mental hospital if I ever asked her again. I faced bullying for most of the year due to how funny it was to some of my classmates, and they even expected it to happen every day. It was so bad it got to the point where I'd fake being sick, just so I wouldn't have to go back, so I wouldn't have to go through this over and over again. I felt like the most useless child to ever walk the earth and thought about how peaceful death would have been because I'd finally be free from being constantly targeted. So I became a ghost. I just sat there letting everything fall apart around me, and the only sense of freedom was art. I'd draw until it was time to go home. 
I started eating to put on more weight because of how some of my classmates commented on it, and then I looked like a skeleton. But then when I did eat, they called me fat and I was left with throwing up my food afterwards. I developed an eating disorder due to this, and if it weren't for the fact that I was born with a fast metabolism, I wouldn't look as skinny as I do now. I'd had enough of it, so one day I wrote a suicide note in class. My special education teacher found it in my desk and asked me to come to her office to talk about the concerning nature of the note, but I knew she was acting. She never cared for me past fifth grade anyway, and that was when I was supposedly gifted and had more of a bright future. After graduation, I was sent to summer school for my horrible grades and attendance, but I've grown scared of my teachers there too. One of them pulled me to the side and asked what was wrong with me, and I lost it right there. I cried for what seemed like forever, and my mum was called to pick me up early. I told my mum again and this time she told me that the reason why she'd never bothered to care about me, why she'd let me go through all this, was because she was having fun in the house by herself and she didn't want me to ruin it. But she said she was sorry for letting me go through it. I love my mum, but I'll never forgive her for this, and I'll never forget what I had to go through. Because the people who were supposed to help me were instead breaking me down for being different. I'll never forgive them for anything. Since that year, I've gotten diabetes, and I'm now trying to learn how to love myself again. My teachers in my high school see me as a smart kid, and it's truly a blessing that I made it out of that situation alive. As for my homeroom teacher, she retired afterwards, and I have no idea where my special ed teacher is now. But I hope she's doing alright in her life, because you have to be all the way messed up to do that to a child and think it's alright. This happened about 15 years ago when I was 21 and living in my very first apartment alone. It was a small bachelor apartment in a sketchy area, but I grew up in a town that was known to be rough, so I knew how to handle myself, and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not to go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar, and a lot of the clientele would stand outside to smoke. However, I noticed that when they did, they would be looking at my apartment in particular. Most of them kept to themselves, a few would nod and say hello if I passed by, and there was never any real issues. That is, until one evening. I'd come home from work and passed the bar, then I noticed this extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed him he stared at me, so I gave him a slight nod, but he didn't acknowledge me. He just continued to stare. It made me uncomfortable, but I didn't think much of it. When about an hour later, I heard a knock at my door. It was odd because you have to buzz people into the building first, and the place only had eight units of residence, which I didn't really know of, so I froze as I really didn't want to talk to anyone. But the knocking continued, so I finally shouted out, Who is it? There was no response. I shouted again to ask who was there and the voice said, It's Tom. Now I didn't know anyone named Tom. So I shouted back, I don't know anyone named Tom, you must have the wrong apartment. You may not know me, but I know you. Open up so we can talk, the voice replied. I decided then to go over to the peephole to see it was the tall dude from the bar standing there. I loudly said, Go away or I'm calling the cops. I thankfully then heard his footsteps walking away and the building door open and then close. He was gone or so I thought, because a few minutes later I peeked out of the window and he was standing in the parking lot, seemingly talking to himself. At this point I was really freaking out, so I called my landlord who lived in the building next to me and he told me to call the police, and in the meantime him and his brother would come check things out. I called the police and told them what was going on, and they said a car was on the way. Meanwhile my landlord and his brother made their way to the parking lot whilst I watched out my window to see them approaching the tall dude. Tall dude took one look at them and bolted. Then my landlord and his brother tried to chase him, but he got away. About five minutes later the police arrived. I gave my version of events and also a description of the man, 
and the officer then stared at me. We've had reports of a man matching that description who has been sexually assaulting women. Thank God you didn't open the door, he said. A few days later I got a call from the officer, telling me that that part of their investigation was talking to the owner of the bar, who'd called the police when Tall Dude reappeared after a few days. The police responded and finally arrested him. So, Tall Creepy Dude from the bar. It was a close call, and I sincerely hope I never see you again. So this happened about 10 years ago when I was in graduate school, working on my master's degree for clinical social work. My practicum was at a confidential shelter, which housed women and children seeking shelter from domestic violence. Since I was an intern, I worked a lot of late shifts, and after closing up the shelter, I would head home. On one such night, it was after midnight, and the roads were fairly empty. I lived in a smaller town at the time, so this was not unusual. And as I approached the stoplight, I noticed a man a few yards away, walking towards the crosswalk. I suddenly felt very anxious and had an unsettling feeling, so I immediately locked my car doors. This was before I had a car with automatic locks, and I usually drove without locking them, as I had never felt unsafe whilst doing so. I felt better after having locked my doors and pulled up to the red light, staring ahead, when I noticed the man had never crossed the street. I glanced to my right to where I'd seen him earlier and came face to face with his face pressed up against my passenger window. I screamed, honked my horn and told him to go away, but he just continued to stand there, staring right at me. He tried the handle of the door without success and I continued screaming at him, honking my horn and waiting for the red light to change. The man straightened up then, stepped away from the passenger side door and moved quickly to my driver's side door, trying the handle there but without success he stood with a wide stance next to my car, as though he was about to lunge. At that moment I thought to myself, screw it, and slammed the gas to run the red light. The man kind of stumbled when I did this, and I think I ran over his foot in my escape. When I arrived home I woke up my husband to tell him and called the police, but they never found him, as by the time they'd sent someone out he was long gone. The police officer commended me for running the red light, as well as for potentially running over the man's foot. So to the creepy man who tried to get into my car in the middle of the night, let's not meet. America Online was a big thing when I was 13, or in other words, for my generation, AIM which stood for AOL Instant Messenger. It was around 2002, and I would have been a fresh 13-year-old in 8th grade. I had many times gone into chat rooms by myself or with friends to goof around, but unfortunately, unsolicited photos were a thing too, usually us being able to steer clear of them by making sure you entered the right chat room. Now, I didn't have any photos of myself, as it wasn't so easy to upload them, Plus I was 13 and self-conscious, which I'm sure anyone can relate with. But one day a guy popped up on my screen wanting to chat. It went fine at first. I was very naive back then and we quickly fell into a pattern of talking. His name was Dave and lived in California. And eventually he was telling me he loved me, etc. Problem being, he was 19. Now I wasn't proud of this, but at first, at 13... I just sent pictures of some random girl and said it was me, and he instantly fell for me, telling me that age was just a number and I was mature. At this point he didn't live in that same state as me, so I was sure there was never any chance of us meeting. But eventually he told me that he and his mum were moving up to a city that was about an hour and a half away from me, so he then started begging me to go see a movie with him, or just do anything. I had to break the catfishing truth then and tell him the pictures I'd sent weren't actually me, and understandably he was furious. He'd been looking forward to a different type of child this whole time. He 
He forgave me a few days later and said that he still wanted to meet me as he loved me. All the things you'd say to a young girl to get her to swoon. Which looking back at now I think, wow, I was only 13. I told my best friend everything that had been going on and I wanted her to go with me to meet him. We had this whole plan of him driving over to see me and going to see a movie. I was finally meeting what I thought was the love of my life. But I had been brainwashed into believing this was normal behaviour. I didn't tell my mum, of course, and she honestly hadn't noticed any of it. She's never been too involved in my life, if you catch my drift. So the day my friend and I were going to meet up with Dave, her mum came and picked us up from school, and she said something that made my stomach drop. Chrissy, you are not going to the movies. You are not going to meet that man. You are going to get seriously hurt or kidnapped, and I can't allow you guys to go. I cried and cried because I honestly thought I could handle everything and be fine. So she told me she wasn't going to tell my mum, but I had to promise to never speak to him again and never plan to ever meet a stranger online. He'd apparently shown and was beyond upset that I wasn't there. We were on AIM and he completely flew off the handle, like nothing I'd ever seen before at that age, and it really scared me. It terrified me at how close I was to this man being near me, so I never talked to Dave again, but I truly believe that I would have been kidnapped or worse that day if my best friend's mum hadn't stepped in. My mum was none the wiser, and to be honest, neither was I. But I'm here today and learned an important lesson. Nobody is what they seem, and make sure to keep your kids close. This story was back in summer 2015. It was around 8pm and it was just getting dark. Now I live in a town where there is almost no crime and it's a very safe rural area with few people. All the shops close early, so that night I went shopping around 7.40 and everything was quiet. But I didn't have enough money to pay for everything, so I went home to get the extra money I needed, and as I did so I was listening to music. I had just bought new headphones and was trying them out, and as I was walking two blocks from my house, a motorcycle with two men came out from nowhere. The man on the back got off the bike and drew a gun pointing it at my head and started yelling to give him my things. I was completely paralysed with fear, but I managed to yell, no. He then shouted to give him my cell phone. Give me everything, he repeated over and over, and I just squeezed my cell phone and headphones and yelled, no, no, these are my things, and the whole time the gun was pointed at my face from a metre or so away. When he realised I wasn't going to give them anything, he fired the gun and I very clearly saw how he'd pulled the trigger. He got back on the motorcycle and they sped off. But even the gun went off, I'd not been hit which made me wonder whether the gun was even real. It was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. As soon as they'd left I ran and finally made it back to the store, crying and shaking as I entered. It was hard for me to speak, but I managed to ask for help and they called my mum, who then picked me up. That was the first and last time I'd experienced a robbery attempt, but it was the most stressful situation I've ever been through. I don't know how to describe the absolute panic I felt when I saw the barrel of a gun in front of my eyes, and all for a cheap cell phone, and some headphones. I wish that no one else has to go through this, much less children. But I was lucky, and many aren't, especially in the city to which my town belongs, where this is a common occurrence. When I was in my early twenties, I moved to Southern California with my aunt. Once I had a job established and a steady income, I found an apartment that was really affordable at $350 a month plus utilities, which was the first red flag because California is not cheap. The other residents in the apartment were a 45-year-old male named Zach and a 45-year-old female named Tina. They weren't a couple. Tina was a little difficult to deal with very OCD on a lot of things, and we mostly avoided each other. 
but this story is about Zack and his friend Mike, who's also 45. Mike and Zack were childhood friends, and Mike lived in the same apartment complex as us, so he was over a lot. Every time I would come home from work, they would be polishing off a handle of vodka, then would go out, which of course I didn't really think much of, other than, damn lady, you sure can put it away. I wasn't very comfortable in that living situation, but it was cheap. I was in school and I was just trying to make the best of it. I got along with Zack for the most part if it was just him around, but Mike was just a time bomb. Here are just a few instances that gradually got worse over time. The first incident, Zack had invited me out with Mike and another friend of theirs to a local bar a couple of miles away. I was comfortable around Zack, so I got into the passenger side of his truck. I hadn't had any negative interactions with anyone until this point, but Mike went ballistic in our complex parking lot about how I was selfish and had no business in the front seat because I wasn't Zack's girlfriend. It was weird because a man the same age as my dad was throwing a tantrum over the passenger seat, so I just got out and went back to my apartment. Now my first rent check had bounced, so I apologised to Zack and discovered that it was because my check had misprinted the account number. So I paid in cash, paid off the bounce check fee and thought that that was the end of it. That is until one evening when I got home, and Mike was over as normal. But he started interrogating me on why I couldn't pay my rent. I was only 22 at the time and didn't really want issues, so I explained that I'd apologised and taken care of it. But Mike wouldn't let it go. He just kept screaming at me, saying I was lazy and that I should be evicted, etc. So the iPhone 6 had just come out around this time, and Mike had gotten himself one, and apparently he would let me look at it if I gave him head. What do you say to that when this guy is always trying to scream at you? We weren't friends and had never really had a good interaction between us, so I just kind of did some finger guns at him and was like, ah, you got me, and went into my room. It's also important to note that Mike and Zack both had two DUIs each. Zack was a school teacher and ended up being let go, but both men continued to drink excessively, pretty much all the time. I eventually had to have a key made for the lock on my bedroom door, as it would get pretty violent often, so that was how I kept myself safe. A lot of other incidences happened, but the following one took the cake, and is the main point to this story. Zack and Mike had gone out and took an Uber to whatever local bar. I had gotten home and went straight to my room as always, when I heard the front door swing open, and Mike, completely wasted, was screaming his head off about how he'd lost his new iPhone. He began beating on my bedroom door, demanding to be let in because he knew that I had it. I cracked my door a little, and he stepped away with his fists balled up like he was going to hit me, so of course I told him I didn't have the phone. He brought up again about how my rent check had bounced and how obviously I needed the money. Then he demanded that he come into my room and tear it apart to look for his phone. I said absolutely not and locked the door, but he started banging on it, trying to unlock it, threatening my life, saying he was going to rape me so I can get what I deserve for being a thief, and lots of other gross and scary things. He told me that if I called the police, he would beat me to a bloody pulp. And this was especially scary, because my aunt was my only other family member nearby, and she wasn't really very helpful. She would just tell me to be an adult and deal with it. I told Zack a couple of days later that I would be moving out immediately, and would not be paying rent for that month. When out of Zack's dark bedroom, Mike popped out with his creepy, sinister smile and said, Bye, in an almost taunting way. I hurried into my room and locked the door and I could hear Zack blaming Mike for me moving out, but he just continued to call me names and asked how I had the money to move out. The iPhone was eventually found for anyone who's curious. It had fallen out of his pocket in the Uber he was in, but obviously the first step to finding the iPhone was to flip out on me instead of calling the Uber driver. This was almost a decade ago, and I don't know what happened to that pair, but I wish them nothing but the worst. So Mike and Zack, I'm glad we crossed paths because it makes for a good story, and I learned that if I can deal with two insane men, I can deal with literally anyone. But please, let's never meet again. This 
This happened to me about three years ago, and was brought up recently with my friends, who suggested I post it here. I've gone through therapy because of this, and trained in firearms too, as this was the creepiest night of my life. I spent a night in what felt like a horror movie, and it's still so vivid. It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work, my husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night, so I was home alone with my dogs. An 80 pound Aussie mix, and my 80 pound German Shepherd Pitbull mix. Now I always have issues sleeping when I'm home alone, so I tend to just binge watch TV in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This particular night I remembered that the trash pickup was coming the next day, so I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, then would take the trash out. All of a sudden I realised it was 1.30am and I still hadn't taken the trash to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door and backyard. Lighting on our street or anywhere in our neighbourhood isn't that great, but it's a quiet area with a lot of families and you rarely hear about crime here. So I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbour smoking a cigarette outside his gate across the street and he was looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbour across the street hides his smoking from his wife, so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. And because I get off work late, I usually see him and we wave, say hi, chat a little. Then I go inside and he makes the joke. You didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I went outside, grabbed my trash cans, opened my squeaky iron gate and took them out to the curb. I didn't have my glasses on at the time though, so as usual I waved and said hello. But the guy, who I thought was my neighbour, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that it was not my neighbour who I'd seen, so I was a little creeped out, because he was clearly staring into my window from across the street. I was also creeped out because maybe it was a guy taking a night walk, which isn't usual around here, and he'd just stopped for a cigarette on his way. I thought I'd probably weirded him out as much as he had me, so I went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point I fell asleep then woke up hearing my gate squeaking and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog you can take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is more passive, but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly too though. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain and my gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog however continued to growl at my front door. So I looked out another window which had a better view of my front yard and porch and I didn't see anything from there either. So eventually my dog settled back down with my other dog but I was still uneasy and I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't get back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak. We are the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate, and the noise it makes is very distinctive. So I looked out through the curtains again, whilst my dogs were continued to softly growl. My gate was halfway open, but I still didn't see anyone. At this point I was panicking though, and in my panic I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down and started going through the couch cushions, looking for my phone. My dogs were oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assumed no one was there. However, the minute I found my phone, my front door handle started shaking. I ran to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out, knowing he'd protect me as he can jump the six foot back gate, and my Aussie mix going crazy burst out one of our door side lights. I heard the guy say, oh shit, and immediately let out my GSD mix. I jumped up to look out the window, and saw my dog latch onto the guy's hand as he began screaming, taking off down the street with my dog chasing him. I then became terrified that he would hurt my dog, so I ran out with my baseball bat screaming my dog's name over and over, and the next thing I knew my dog was prancing down the street back to me, happy as a pig in poop blood smeared all over his face. I called the police, but they took another hour or so to show up, as I guess they hadn't taken me too seriously. 
but they said they'd call the local hospitals, and I never heard back from them. I called my husband, bawling. He got on the next flight home, and I stayed with his mum for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good and saving me. So, creepy guy, let's not meet, because my dog might finish the job he started. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.